Romans chapter 13. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to uh, forgo reading the entirety of Romans chapter 13. Maybe just that first verse, it says, Romans 13 and verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Verse 2. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. I'm talking today about civilized Christians. Civilized Christians. So go with me back a few chapters to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> There's six points I want to deal with in dealing with civilized Christians. How we're to behave within this civilization that we're currently abiding in. Sometimes it seems like we're captors, but there's a few things that we in fact are biblically in regard to this civilization. First, we are the children of God. Second, we are strangers and pilgrims on earth. Third, we have a few things in common with the world, but by and large, we should be separate from them. Fourth, we are ambassadors of Christ, meaning we are examples of Christ. We are authorized representation or messengers of Christ as ambassadors. And fifth, we are to be subject to higher powers in this life, and also we must be loving examples of our Lord. Romans chapter 9 talks to the fact that we are the children of of God. We are the children of God. Roman or John chapter 1, we know the Bible says as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So very plainly it says when you believe on Christ, you're given power to become the sons of the living God. We are born of God. We are born of God. And the parentheses there being not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, none of those things. No, no, no. Born of God, therefore the children of God. Galatians chapter 3 says, we are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Just another way of saying the exact same thing that John chapter 1 says. In Romans chapter 9, it begins to explain this as well. Romans 9, and in verse 1, it says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to to the flesh. So here the Apostle Paul is referring to its heart's desire for his kinsmen according to the flesh. His kinsmen that are of Israel according to the flesh. This is not referring then to the birthing of the children of God. He's not talking about the children of God. No, no, no. It's those that are according to the flesh. And therefore, there's a contrast that's taking place here. Paul's fleshly brethren and his spiritual Brethren, Verse 4 continues and says, Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises? Whose are the fathers, and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever? So the Bible here records that Christ Jesus came up in that same line of flesh being the Israelites that have the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises all pertaining unto them because of God's grace that he extended to that particular people, Israel. But Christ came to his own and his own received him not. John says very clearly, he came specifically to these Kinsmen of the Apostle Paul according to the flesh, the same kinsmen that Christ had according to the flesh. He came to his own, his own received him not. Verse 6, though, lest we should think that the word of God 
became of none effect. Verse 6 of A says, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. So the Apostle Paul is saying, it hasn't taken, um, it is not of no effect. It's not that it's not true just because they rejected him. But it's, eff it's effectively that the word of God doesn't become true just because Israel, let's say, didn't receive him. Rather, there is a different seed that all of these promises we're speaking about. The second half of that verse says, For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Apostle Paul says, Hey, there is a children of the flesh. They received him not, though they were in lockstep to having the promises, having the scriptures, having the adoption available to them, having the service of God, all of these advantages that they had, they rejected it, but that doesn't mean that the word of God isn't true. It's effectual because the spiritual seed is Israel, and just because they're not Israel of the flesh, there is an Israel of the spirit. Here the Apostle Paul is showing, if you continue down in verse 7, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Here's a distinction. The carnal that have the land, that have the people, that have the nation, that group carnally speaking, is separate from the spiritual that has the promise and a people and a nation. Two different things are happening right here. And they are not all of Israel, spiritually, that are of Israel according to the flesh. There's a difference here. Therefore, Israel of the promise, the moment they believe, become that seed and to their original group, the own that Christ came for, the ones according to the flesh that he came for, when they become saved by faith, they become strangers to that nation, don't they? There's a distinction that's being made. Look, there's a big group known as Israel according to the flesh that are of Abraham's seed. When they believe and become children of the promise, children of God, they are no longer a part of that nation according to the flesh, spiritually speaking. No, rather they have a new home, a new promise, a new people they are, and they're a new nation. And the Apostle Paul is reaching from the position of being spiritually the Son of God, of Israel, that is according to the Spirit. He's reaching back to those and wishing that he could save more of them. Even offering himself in order that he could save them. But we know that that simply would not ever take place because once you're saved, you're always saved. Sorry about that, the Apostle Paul. But he was just expressing his longing for those that are according to the flesh. Now, though, the Apostle Paul, as well as any one of us, are strangers to that fleshly nation. So, first, we are children of God, and therefore, number two, we are strangers and pilgrims on earth. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, to the right of your Bible. So, in Hebrews 11, we've been there a whole bunch. It's an amazing chapter dealing with faith. In Hebrews 11, it talks of a good confession that was made. These of faith did not receive the promise, being all those Old Testament saints. But by faith, they were persuaded of the promises. By faith, they embraced the promise and they made this wonderful confession that we need to confess. We are strangers and pilgrims on this earth. In other words, by faith they knew that there's a promise afar off. And I'm pushing 30, 40, 50, 60, whatever it is, those great men of old thought. And I may not see that promise. But I accept it. I'm persuaded of it. I embrace it. And this isn't my home. In other words, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. This is not their home as the children of God. Their home is where God's home is. Ephesians 2, let's begin at the famous verse 8. Ephesians 2 and verse 8. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should work, we should walk 
in them. Sorry. So as the workmanship of God, as the creation of God, as the very children of God by that gift of life, we ought to then live differently than those that are not the children of God. And this is what he's talking about. You should walk in the good works that are prescribed here. Verse 11, wherefore, what's that pointing to? Therefore, wherefore, because you're saved, because you've received the gift of God, because you are his workmanship, wherefore, verse 11, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, there's a key, you being in time past in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ. Watch this. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Now remember, we already read that they are not all of Israel which are of Israel. So there's a distinction being made here. The commonwealth of Israel here being the one that's according to the flesh. Why? Because the verse previously just says that those that are circumcised in the flesh will call you uncircumcised. Why? Because you're of the Gentiles. You didn't go through that ritual. You are different physically and fleshly speaking. So this commonwealth of Israel, it says, and strangers, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, according to the flesh, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. In other words, you in time past in your flesh did not have the same benefits that Israel, according to the flesh, had. What were those listed? Well, we saw that they were inheritors of promise. They were inheritors of the scriptures. They understood via their, their ordinances and all they did. They were, had every advantage to become the children of God, and yet they rejected it as Christ came to them and they received him not. So, remember what you were. You were strangers from the commonwealth of Israel according to the flesh. You were strangers from that because you were born a Gentile, it says, now though, look at verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So now you are nigh. You're so close that you're related to Christ. You're the son of God when you've believed him by faith because of his blood shed for you and because of the faith that you put upon him. So... What happened then at that time was Israel, according to the flesh, was this vine. And the Bible says in other passages of Romans that some were cut out that we could be grafted in. In other words, God made place in his vine for the Gentiles. Not as if it was some afterthought because the Jews rejected. No, 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 that was always his plan. It's just through the course of time. This is how it acted out. Gentiles were always being saved. We just learned about Rahab today, didn't we? She would have been called a Gentile. She would have been called uncircumcised by the circumcision of the flesh. The commonwealth of Israel would have looked at her as not of us, right? But she was a part of something better. She was made nigh by the blood of Christ that was shed from the foundation of the world. And then a few thousand years later, it would have come to fruition when Christ was on that cross and shed his precious blood. So... Strangers from the commonwealth of Israel, but now a part of Israel according to promise. And that's what it says. Continuing down in verse 14. For he is our peace, who hath made of both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh, that's the flesh of Christ, the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, and so making peace. So Christ in his own body hath made two become one. In other words, he's busted down that wall that was contained in the ordinances and in the sacrifices and in the teachings of the Old Testament law. And the thing that they all had being the circumcision in the flesh, but they rejected it and didn't do nothing with it. And they, they essentially, their commonwealth became some sort of fleshly thing. Christ threw that down and opened up an opportunity for the uncircumcision, the Gentiles according to the flesh, to be saved. And he says in um, verse 16, and that he might reconcile both to God in one body 
by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. So when Christ came to this earth, there's another verse that says, he wasn't just going to preach to the Jews. He preached to those that were close and nigh, and those that were afar off. He preached to everybody because he wanted everybody to be part of what's referred to as spiritual Israel, which is the Israel according to the Spirit, and the only true Israel, in fact. Verse 19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God. Now, just because you're not a stranger and a foreigner to the household of God, being God's child, being the son of God, being the child of God, you are now made nigh, you are now of his blood, you are family with God, just because you're not strangers and foreigners to that, that by default makes you strangers and foreigners to what is according to the flesh. Here a division is taking place again. We're seeing very clearly the children of God and the children of this world distinct. And if you are a stranger to the covenant and the promise of God, then as soon as that changes and you become in the promise and covenant of God, you're stranger to the other, the fleshly, the world at large. And so that's what's happened here. There's a difference and a separation that has taken place. And now we are strangers to this world. We are foreigners to this world because we are fellow citizens of the household of God. And it continues on in verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. In other words, our foundation is the apostles. It is the prophets. It's the scriptures that whole, but ultimately Christ is the chief cornerstone that is holding all of that up and in place. He is the chiefest of cornerstones. He is the rock. He is all that's holding our foundation together. Verse 21 in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. We are built upon Jesus that God through the Spirit might inhabit us. That's amazing. And that's why Christ made that statement. It is expedient that I go away, for if I go not away, then the Comforter cannot come to you. He's saying that he had to go away so that God could inhabit us through the Spirit. And that's the greatest promise that us in the New Testament era could have ever received, is not only to have the Spirit of God upon us, but have Him abiding in us, and never, 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 never leaving us, nor forsaking us at that time, through the promise that Christ had made. So that's a wonderful gift and a blessing there. But here, what I want to grab hold of is that there is a difference made. And verse 10 highlights... For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in him. We are different. We should walk different than this world. Why? Because we're strangers and foreigners to it, but we're of the household of God. So what should we do? We should walk separately as God would have us walk. The third point I want to highlight. We have a few things in common with the world, don't we? We live in the same spaces we live in the same cities we walk in the same dirt we breathe the same air we have many things that are common with the world around us and the nation around us but we should be separate and distinct nonetheless second corinthians chapter six second corinthians chapter six to the left in your bible a few pages second corinthians chapter six. First point i made is that we are the children of god by faith in Christ Jesus. Second point, we are strangers and pilgrims on this earth. In other words, we belong to a spiritual nation. We'll see more about that in a little bit. Thirdly, as such, we should be separate. We should act separate like we are separate. Second Corinthians chapter 6, look with me in verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. In other words, that according to the flesh nation whatever they call themselves, however their system operates, the unsaved world, the unbelieving world, don't be unequally yoked together with it. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And we're made righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. And what communion hath light with darkness? We are to be lights in this world and the world can only produce darkness we're to shine our light in it and what concord hath christ with belial and we are in christ 
and he is in us, according to the promise made. Or what part hath he that believeth, which is our faith, with an infidel, an unbeliever? How do we have any part with him? How can we have any part with him? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. What agreement do you have then, being that God is living in you, dwelling in you, walking in you, being your God, and he says, you will be my people. Why? Because you have left off your old habitation, and now you abide with and in me. You belong to me. You're my son. You, you are of my nation. Wherefore, okay, so being that this is the spiritual truth of the matter, you are the Son of God. You ought to walk like the Son of God. You ought to be separate. Because all this is true, he says, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. The unclean thing simply being the sins. Don't be partakers of their sins. Don't have fellowship with their unrighteousness. Don't have communion with their darkness. Don't have concord with, with their devil. Don't be having part with an infidel and having agreement with some dumb idol when you are the temple of the living God and he abides with you. Therefore, come out from the world, be separate, be a stranger even as you are a stranger in this world. In verse 18 it says, And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And there's the authority there. I will be your father. Why? Because the Lord Almighty, because I say so. Verse 7 talks to the separation that we ought to have. Or verse 1 in chapter 7, it says, Having therefore these promises, everything that's been mentioned up to here, having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And if we walk in the fear of God, we will always, always, always yield to his order and his direction. Why? Because there's nothing more fearful than God and falling into his hands. So, both loving and terrible as our father is, we need to walk as his children. And you know what? Our children have the same, um, rep they should have the same relationship with us. I love my dad, but man, I fear his anger when I mess up, right? You and, and that's the relationship we ought to have with our God. Love him so much and look to him in his wisdom, but ultimately fear him and his correction and his rebuke and his chastisement. Therefore, that should encourage me to walk in the ways that God's children ought to be. Walk as children of God. Walk separately. Perfect holiness in reverence and in fear of him. What we ought to do is represent him rightly. Cleanse ourselves from filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. That's both the actions that you're doing with this body. It's also the thoughts that are entering into your heart. Cleanse yourself of these things. Wash your hands, you sinners, it says in the book of James. <clears throat> draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. And as a result, represent him correctly. Ultimately, we're ambassadors for Christ, as I said before. What's an ambassador? An ambassador is to be an example of the nation, the people, who he's representing. When we send an ambassador from Canada to another country, he's probably a liberal weirdo. Why? Because he's representing our country, full of liberal weirdos, okay? But as ambassadors for Christ... We need to be example of Christ Jesus. And you've got a whole Bible to look in to find out what Christ and who Christ is. We are authorized to give representation of Christ. We are authorized as ambassadors to be messengers of Christ. And that's what comes with, with, with our, our, our blessing to be in that position. But there's also great responsibility that goes along with it. So, continuing on, we're the children of God. We're strangers in this earth. We should be separate as we are separate and we ought to behave as ambassadors for Christ, representing him accordingly. First Peter chapter two. First Peter chapter two. Great scripture up here. First Peter chapter two. To the right after Hebrews, James, first Peter chapter two. <clears throat> I want to talk about us as ambassadors for Christ, which we are. We represent him whether we like it or not. 
And unfortunately, some of us represent him rather poorly. We ought to represent him in spirit and truth. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And the best offering of sacrifice that we could give to him is ourselves. Present yourselves a living sacrifice. That's what he says. You're lively stones. You're a living stone. Look, we have Christ as the foundation. We have the law and the prophets there, as well as the apostles built up upon that. And we're to be put on that spiritual house in the same vein and re representing the same likeness of Christ, the Bible. And then there's us built up on that spiritual house to present ourselves as a spiritual sacrifice unto him. That's what being an ambassador for Christ looks like. Verse 6, it says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures. Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, that's me, unto you, therefore, which believe, that's you, by the grace of God, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, you know, the world at large, the unbelievers, those that were to be separate from, those that were to have no unequaled yoking with, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. In other words, the one that they rejected is the one that is in charge. Glory to God. Verse 8, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, and whereunto also they were appointed. You can see how it could be a challenge to be an ambassador for Christ. When Christ is the head of the corner that is precious to us, but he's refused by the disobedient. Disallowed by the disobedient. They stumble over him. They're offended by him and by his word, and they're appointed to that same position. And so when we come as an ambassador, we're coming to a hostile nation, aren't we? Verse 9, it says, but ye are a chosen generation. So in contrast to being disobedient, in contrast to being an unbeliever, in contrast to being all of those things that were mentioned previous as what we are to be separate from, he says, ye are chosen as a generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're called, we're chosen to come out of the darkness that is, that unbelieving world, that stumbling, always offended world, and we're to be light in this world. We're to be the people of God, peculiar. We're to be royal. We're to be chosen and holy and in the image of our God, who hath called us to be so. Verse 10, it says, which in time past were not a people. Right? We were just part of the nations, whether we were of those that are called the circumcision or those that are called uncircumcision by the circumcision, Jew or Gentile. We're no longer part of that world. It says, ye were not a people. And honestly, I was not a people. I didn't feel I identified with any people before I was saved, but it says here, but now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now, amen, have obtained mercy. We're the people of God. Therefore, as the people of God, what is our charge? What is our responsibility? How are we to walk, talk, look, and behave? Well, we're to look like God as we are his people and as we are his children, as we are under his authority and as we are ambassadors for him. Here's a little charge, an open letter from our beloved Peter in verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Look at him acknowledging that same wonderful profession of the faithful in verse or chapter 11 of Hebrews. I beseech you, I'm encouraging, I'm, I'm asking you as strangers and pilgrims that what? What's your responsibility? That ye obtain from fleshly lust with war which war against the soul in other words abstain from that which your flesh loves most you have to be a little bit sacrificial in this don't you you have to want what god wants more than what your dead as a doornail body wants what your flesh desires he says and continues you war you have that war against your soul lust warring against your soul and that's how sin enters in by the lusts that are already there present in your body you put them aside, in verse 12 it says, having your conversation 
honest among the Gentiles. And that's not just what you say, but that's also what you do. So you're to have an honest conversation, honest actions under Christ as his people, showing who you are, what verse 9 represents, before them. That whereas they speak against you as evildoers, and why would they do so? Why? Because they're stumbling at what is in you and who is in you. They're stumbling at your God, and you're his people. So they're going to speak against you as evildoers. Why? Because they, they love the darkness. They've called what is good evil and what is evil good. And so when you go about doing good, they'll just say, oh, that's evil having a family. That's evil going to church on Sunday. That's evil, da, 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 so on and so forth. They may, it continues, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorified God in the day of, of visitation. And so even though they speak evil against you, there's going to be no choice but to glorify God for the good works which you do in that day of visitation. Verse 13, and the same is true about him. They're going to have no choice but to glorify God in that same day of visitation. Verse 13, it says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Now notice that, that addendum to that. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man, no matter what. No, it's for the Lord's sake. In other words, because it's what he desires. Because it's his ordinance. It says, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him, that's God, for the punishment of evildoers. So these governors, those that are in authority, those kings as supreme are sent by God for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Do you know what they're supposed to do? You do well, they praise you. You do wrong, they punish you. That's the purpose of governors kings as supreme in this world. Verse 15, we'll get to um, later. So what we have then is our charge is to live honestly, to live humbly in this world and under this governance. We're to be humble. We're to live honestly. We're to submit ourselves to every ordinance that man would place over us for the sake of God, Almighty God. But what's their then charge and responsibility it's simply the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those. So we're, we're in a time, though, where we have a conflict here. Because is our government only and simply, our kings and our governors as a type here, are they only and simply doing their responsibility? Are they only punishing evildoers and then also only praising those that do good? No. They've gotten themselves involved in so many other areas that I believe God never sanctioned and therefore they have in every definition of the word overstepped what their given authority is here. This portion of the scripture highlights very clearly, look, we are to live humbly, honestly, submitting ourselves to this world as they govern us by simply punishing evil and rewarding good. That is their responsibility. But they've overstepped and they're doing much, 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 much more than that. Verse 15, it continues on and it says, For so is the will of God. What is the will of God? People always ask, what is God's will for my life? Here's one of the, his wills. That with well-doing he may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, which we are in Christ, as free, which we are in our final and spiritual and eternal home, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. In other words, we're serving God, and just because we are free, and just because I'm just passing through this land, heaven's my home, it does not give me the ability to just use that freedom that I have to be malicious to people that are here. In other words, just because the government oversteps and they're not performing their two primary roles here, punishing evil and rewarding good, just because they've overstepped and done more, I'm free from every aspect that they would push on me other than that. That's what this is saying. I'm an ambassador for Christ. I'm a stranger. I'm a foreigner. I don't live here, okay? I'm free from all those. But I'm not going to use my liberty as a cloak of maliciousness and use it to be malicious towards the government that's over me. But... 
I'm a servant of God. And so as a servant of God, I can put up with a little bit of that, can I? I can put up with a little bit of mandate. I can put up with a little bit of speed limit. I can put up with a little bit of parking ticket. I can put up with a little bit of taxes. I can put up with a little bit of the scores of ways that government gets involved in my life of which they have absolutely no sanction from God to be. I'm free from that. I ought to be free from that, but I'm not going to be malicious. I'm going to serve God in the capacity that I can, in the area that he has put me, in the place that I abide in, under the government and the authority that he has put over me, I can still be a servant of God and fulfill my side of the bargain, which is what? Be humbly. Be humble before him. Which is what? Um, walk honestly before him. Submitting myself to these ordinances as unto the Lord, for the Lord's sake. I'm an ambassador, but it's the will of God that with my well-doing in this world, I would put to silence the ignorance of the foolish men that are trying to oppress me. Show them just how humble I can be. Show them how I can submit as a servant of God under these rules. Okay? That's what I'm to do. Okay? The next point, I'm an ambassador for Christ. I'm to be separate and distinct as a result because I'm the children of God, a stranger and a foreigner in the nation of Canada where I live now because my home is heaven. I openly confess that I am a stranger and I am a pilgrim where I walk today. And I'm looking forward to a promise that one day will be mine, though I may not even see it in this lifetime. The last point, the second to last point, they kind of go together, is we are to be subject to Higher powers. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. <clears throat> so, again, not using my liberty, my freedom that I have in Christ. Seeing I don't even live in this nation. I'm just visiting. I'm just passing through. I'm just an ambassador here. I have liberty to follow every rule and ordinance of God. But, at the same time, look where I live. I live under an earthly government. And so, we're to be subject unto higher powers and we're to be good examples while we are here not using our liberty as an occasion for maliciousness but servants of god humbly walking with him and submitting ourselves into higher powers and look at the good example of how you can be exactly that how do you submit yourselves unto higher powers well recall a good example of peter Willing to obey God rather than men and preach Christ. He was being subject unto higher powers in that case. Look at John the Baptist who showed how submissive he was in subjection to higher powers when he stood before the king and magistrate Herod and exposed his unlawful wicked deeds. Look at how Rahab showed her submission to higher powers and the authorities of her nation there when she took of spies that were coming to destroy her nation and led them out another way. She was then being subject unto the higher powers. That seems kind of contrary, doesn't it? Because in all points, these people were fighting back, speaking against, you know, doing what they could to thwart the governments that they were under. Why? Because they were subject unto higher powers. And this is what everyone misses about Romans chapter 13 and verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. God himself, one of his titles is the most high God. And so our life ought to be made up of an incremental appeal up to the highest of authorities being God and his scriptures. Now, where authorities, whether it's governments, whether it's husbands to wives, whether it's parents to children, where your authorities are not in their lower position to God Most High, contradictory, where they do not contradict the law of God, you also can submit unto them fully. And there are a lot of things that the government asks us to do that aren't sinful. Don't speed, okay? 
whether you agree with speed limits or not, the government has decided that this is the speed limit. We ought not break that, submitting ourselves unto that authority because you cannot find a verse that says, thou shalt drive 200 kilometers an hour in the speed or in the, in the fast lane. It doesn't exist. And so we submit unto the governing of the, the authorities that be in that area. And we should. We should do it humbly and we should do it even though we are at liberty and our law is here written in the scriptures, okay? Appeal up incrementally to the highest of authorities and where it doesn't contradict beneath it, you can also be under those authorities' rule. The Bible says in the second part of that verse, for, this is like a because. So be subject to higher powers because or for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So powers in general, I don't believe this is an individual statement, but powers are ordained of God. Authority is ordained of God. He did that right from the beginning, Adam and Eve. He made Adam the head, right? And then it was supposed to be Adam, Eve, and then beast. But didn't the world go and turn that upside down where the beast is telling the woman what to do and she's coaxing the man in the same direction? Authority is given and it's ordained of God and it's there for our protection. So when he says the powers are ordained of God, he's not talking, I believe, individual bosses, masters, kings, governments, but it's a general statement. What I mean is Stalin was not God's ordained man. Hitler was not God's ordained man, the man of God. Reagan, Trump, they are not the man of God. They are not ordained of God. These men in particular, but rather the power, the authority that they had was ordained by God. He ordained that structure, not necessarily those that are falling into that structure. Verse 2 then continues and says, Wherefore... Or sorry, whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So if you resist the power, you will receive damnation or you will receive punishment as a result. And that's true, right? Whether it's a good authority or a bad authority, whenever you resist against it, here's another true statement. Resist the power, resisting the ordinance of God and the, and the uh, authority that they've been given, you're going to get punished for it. That's simple. You speed. Here's your big fat ticket. You can't drive anymore. That makes sense, right? You resist the power and you're resisting what God has ordained you to be under. Okay? We continue on in verse 3. It says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Okay? Another just truth statement. They are not intended then to be a terror to good works, but to evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So, under government, do good, receive good. The problem then, the conflict comes and we certainly are seeing it now that sometimes there is evil government that's allowed to be in power isn't it evil government comes in and what they would consider good is actually evil now we have a conflict where the ordinance of god is the power but it's not necessarily what the power is expecting you to do therefore what do you do you appeal up to god every time if they're asking you to sin You've always got Romans chapter 1 and verse 1 to appeal back to. Be subject unto the higher power, the highest being that of God Almighty God. Sometimes, too, what you see is that when a nation does evil and does evil and does evil, as our beloved Canada has done, God will just put an oppressive authority over top of them. And as a result of that, he allows that to take place. He allows wicked leaders to be placed in that position, that ordered position of God. And they also execute wrath upon them that do evil. It's like the, the, uh, the thing of reaping what you sow. If a nation is wicked and wicked and wicked, God just throws a wicked king over them. And he does it to drive them to their knees so they repent and get right with God. So that God can remove that wicked king and then put in a, a, an authority that more resembles 
the people that are being led there. That's what happened. The, the wickedness and the ungodliness of nations is why a Stalin gets into power. It's why a Hitler gets into power. It's why a Reagan or a Trump get into power. They reflect the people that they are overseeing. And so God will allow these changes to take place. But ultimately, our position still is to yield under the authority as much as we can, always appealing up to the highest of authorities, which is our Holy Bible. Verse 5 it says, wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath's sake, but also for conscience sake. And also, he said in another place, and for the sake of God, Almighty God. So, not just because you fear the wrath do you submit under, under authorities' um, rules and regulations and laws. You submit under them not just because you're scared, but you submit under them for the benefit of your own conscience. In other words, conscience is always going to come into play in this. And our conscience ought to be something that is under the authority of God Almighty God. So then that all points to that same idea in verse 1. Being subject unto the higher power. Let your conscience be led of God. Be subject unto God. Be subject unto the authorities. As your conscience, which is led by God, dictates. All should be basically the same thing. Appealing unto the scriptures as the highest authority. This is the bottom line of all of Romans 13. God is the lawmaker. Right? We are at liberty to submit ourselves under other authorities, but we are not un, under, in liberty to submit ourselves under other authorities if they contradict God Almighty God. He is the lawmaker. He ordained leadership to be set up in this way, but he didn't ordain and, and give you know, his hand of approval upon those that would be terrors to good works, but rather to evil. And that's what he is distinguishing here. Do good, receive good under a government that thinks good is good and evil is evil. That's what God is showing here. But as soon as they change and they're an affront to God, you always submit yourselves to God. And that's why I said that Peter saying, uh uh uh, I'm not going to stop preaching Christ, and he goes back out and does it again. He was a good example of obeying the higher powers, as Romans 13. John the Baptist telling Herod that it was unlawful for him to take his brother's wife was perfectly acting out Romans chapter 13 as he rebuked the magistrate and king. Rahab as well, knowing the will of God and thwarting her own nation so that God's will could go forward. Same thing, Romans chapter 13 to a T. Excellent application of this very scripture. So verse 6 it says, for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, keep your finger there in Romans chapter 13. And I just wanted to go for a moment back to our other bookmark in Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. <clears throat> At the end of that chapter there, and I, I, I promised that I would go back to it, I want to deal with what's being um, discussed in regard to tribute, to whom tribute, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and so on, in Romans chapter 13. And Matthew 17 talks a little bit to this. Verse 24, when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, doth you not your master pay tribute? He saith, yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? So Matthew 17, and in verse 25, Jesus goes to Peter and says, What do you think, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? And he gives two questions. It's a multiple choice. 50-50 is the odds of him getting it right. He says, Of their own children or of strangers. Peter thinks for a moment and saith unto him, of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, then are the children free. Now, we determined early on in this sermon that we are strangers and foreigners in the nations that we're currently abiding in. Flesh and blood abides in Canada, and we are strangers here. Jesus asked Peter the question, who are the kings getting their taxes from? Their own children? No, of strangers. Right? That's Peter's response. Then are the children free. Now, strangers pay 
the free then are the sons of Caesar, the sons of the kings, the sons of this world. Okay, I'm building up to this. I'm basically saying that if we are free of paying taxes, who are we? Sons of Caesar. Okay, so, so this is an important part. We're ambassadors. We're to be separate. We are strangers and foreigners here. All of the Bible indicates this is not our home, but we're simply representatives of our home. Jesus is asked the question, or Peter's asked the question, and Jesus turns it around on him. He says, hey, if you're paying taxes, you're a stranger, you're a foreigner, you're biblical in position with Christ, in Christ, saved, blood-bought, child of the king, if you're tax-free, that shows me that you are actually belonging to this world. You are actually one with the king. Because he doesn't receive custom from his own children. He will not get taxed from his own children. Tax-exempt status, then, is and means that you have, in a lot of ways, relinquished your ambassadorship. You become... Even on paper, let's say, one of Caesar's children. You've unequally yoked yourself together with unbelievers if you're to take that tax-exempt status. Now, there was a time, and you can go back to Romans chapter 13. There was a time when I was looking into registering our church with the government as a nonprofit, as a charity, and all the many options that they present. But this scripture just screamed to me the fact that we are strangers, we are ambassadors, we are foreigners in this world. And if we are to take on a free state in this state, in this plane, in this world, we are relinquishing our proper position. And that is, we belong to heaven, and we are only here as ambassadors to give up our position as ambassador is what it would take to become tax-exempt here in this world, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And do you know who is being called and harassed and enforced and visited by police in this time? Those that have taken on tax-exempt status, registered themselves with the government. Essentially, when you do so, you become a child of Caesar of this world, an entity of the world. When you go to them and say, can we please be tax-free? You're saying, would you give us the right to exist? Would you give us permit to be one of your children and be custom-free, tribute-free? That's what we want. If we get into that position, could that be canceled? Could there be other bonds associated with taking that position? I think so. The truth is, regarding this church and regarding us as individuals, is as strangers, we ought to pay taxes. The good news is that when it comes time to pay taxes, Jesus just often says, go fishing. There's going to be money in the fish's mouth. And he can provide miracles whereby we can give Caesar 10, 20, oh, I just did 30% of my tax. It was just kicking the teeth, right? It hurts, right? I, I tithe God 10%. Caesar is asking for 30. Okay, but we do so, and we're enabled, empowered to do so. With respect to the church, we don't exist by permit of the powers that be. Our church isn't a church because Caesar says so. If you take on that status, perhaps that's the case. Could he revoke it? Could he remove it? Could he come visit you and expect you to keep some of his rules that are unbiblical, extra biblical, that are that are that are against what we believe, according to the higher powers? That's it's possible. We don't exist by permit of the powers that be. Rather, we exist by the purchase of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we're a church because he came, died on the cross, shed his precious blood to buy us individually. And we come together and we fulfill all of the different attributes of a congregation, a group of believers. When we do so, we're a church under his authority. And that's as simple as can be. We don't exist because Caesar says we're allowed to exist. Rather, we exist by the purchase of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. We are then, continuing on, all the points. 
the children of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are strangers and pilgrims on earth. Why? Because we are of his blood. We are, we are blood-bought children of the king, and therefore this is not our home because our home is promised us in heaven. And we look forward to that. And we confess that openly. That's actually the, I hate to put it this way, but the carrot on the string we offer to people. If you died today, would you go to my promised home? Would you go to heaven? Would you be with the Lord? We have a few things in common with this world, don't we? We go to the same grocery stores. We eat the same types of food. We breathe the same air, right? We have some things in common, but we should live differently. Peculiar, the Bible says, separately and distinct from the world. We ought to look different, even as light is different than darkness. That's how different God's children ought to be from the children of this world. We are ambassadors for Christ. In other words, he gives us an authority to represent him. Even though we live in heaven, we come down here and we represent him here on earth. If that wasn't the case, when we got saved, he'd just scoop us up and bring us home. Because what other purpose would he have for us to be here? We're his messengers and we're to go in his likeness to a sinful world. At the same time, we are to be subject unto the higher powers, but there is no power but of God. Those powers are ordained of God, but they're responsible for punishing evildoers and rewarding good doers. And what says good and evil but the scriptures? The Bible is the final authority for what is evil, and the government needs to punish that. The Bible is the final authority for what is good, and the Bible need, or the, the uh, government needs to reward that and celebrate that. When they are in their proper place, we can be much easier in our proper place, can't we? Because we can just follow the Word of God and get rewarded by it. But what happens now? You get punished for following the Word of God anymore. Hence, preachers in prison. So, we are to be subject then, and as the fine examples we have going before us, to the higher power, the highest being that of God. If we have to go to Caesar, if we have to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go, and that is what we have to do. And that still would fall under Romans chapter 13 and the proper order that God has given. Caesar has no authority in this house, in this gathering, unless we give it to him. We ought not do that. We ought to keep that sovereign, independent, free position under the authority of God, Almighty God. The final point is that we must be loving examples of the Lord. Romans 13, continue down in verse 8. It says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. In other words, don't fall your into debts, right? But, but show love. Love one another. It says, For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And honestly, when we love our neighbor, we're doing what God does, we're loving him. And that's what Christ said to hang all the law and the prophets on, those two hangers. Those two chains, love for God and love for your neighbor. And he says, when you show love, you're fulfilling all of these commandments. Verse 10, it says, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Why? Because adultery hurts your neighbor. It's ill towards your neighbor, right? Because you're taking something, someone that didn't belong to you. Killing, you're taking someone's life. Stealing, you're taking someone's possession and hurting them and working ill towards them. Bearing false witness, coveting, all of these things. All of these sins in the commandments are one of two things. They're either you sinning against your love for God or you're sinning against your love for man. You can look at that and study it out. I think it's one, two, three, four, maybe five are about God. They're all about God. And then 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and down is all about loving your neighbor as yourself and working no ill towards them, therefore fulfilling the law simply by the expression of love. And honestly, we can't properly express love unless we let Christ, who's in us, live through us because he's the only one that really truly knows how to love unconditionally. Not unconditionally, but love fully and in the fullness of, um, of the expression of that the same. Charity is referred to. And it's completely selfless. So, love is the principal thing. 
as ambassadors for Christ, while we are subject unto others, we must show our love towards our neighbors, and therefore fulfilling that verse, not working any ill towards our neighbor, and therefore fulfilling the law. We're to walk as Christ walks. And the one thing that I want to point out here is, in regard to those examples that I had, Peter, willing to obey God rather than man and preach Christ. If he simply submitted himself to what the higher power above him had said and said, don't preach Christ, is that a loving thing? Absolutely not. The loving thing in that scenario is for Peter to say, sorry, government, I must obey God and preach Christ. I must bring this message of love, of hope, of compassion, of grace to the people. That's the loving thing to do. John the Baptist, when he sees Herod in those unlawful deeds taking another man's wife, would it be loving for him to just embolden him in that and say, that's fine, it's okay, don't worry. No, the loving thing to do was to tell the magistrate what the Bible says. And the most loving thing we can do in the context of Romans 13 is to continue to preach the truth about everything. When the government comes and imposes itself in areas that they ought not, we have to remember that while we consider that institution known as government to be wicked and sinful and, and we hate it, there are people that are working in all areas of that. And not all of them are twice dead, reprobate, plucked up by the roots. A lot of them need to see the loving testimony of a Christian who does something so simple as when they come down and say, you can't assemble, the Christian must say, I must assemble because that's what God wants me to do. They need to see the love that we have for our God and ex have that expressed to them. Because if I just back down and do everything ungodly, who's going to be light in this world? If I just back down to all of the mandates that I know God is a, a front to, and what would I become? The world that I'm supposed to be an ambassador to. Because everybody's following the mandate. Because everybody is, is obeying unjust laws. Because everybody is doing this... Everybody is in darkness. Who is going to be light unless there's a few ambassadors to stand and say, nope, this is the highest authority and you are standing in opposition to it. And that's what Peter did when he went and preached the gospel. That's what John the Baptist did when he went and said, it is unlawful for you to be involved in that marriage. It is wicked, Herod. That was the loving thing to do. The loving thing to do is to tell them when they are wrong and the best way we as a church can tell them that they are wrong is to just keep doing what we are doing in the context of this assembly. We need to keep just simply trusting what God has said is the proper order for his people who are ambassadors here to assemble. We need to keep doing that. And that's the most important thing that we can do. Keep being Christians. He continues in verse 11, it says, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Isn't that true? You're closer to your ultimate home in heaven than yesterday and the day before and the day before. We just keep getting closer to that promise being fulfilled. It says the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us, therefore, cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Walk strong in the light that God has given us. And as he continues to say, hey, you can't assemble. The darkness wants us to not gather together. We need to put on the armor of light and walk in that. Verse 13, let us walk honestly as in the day. Not in rioting and in drunkenness, not in chambering and in wantonness, not in strife and in envy. In other words, we're not causing a disturbance. We're not trying to cause trouble. We're not trying to get into a fight. But, verse 14, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision to the flesh. Fulfill the lust thereof. To fulfill the lust thereof. In other words, we are to put on Christ and walked as he did, and that's the best example we can be in the context that we live in. We can remain ambassadors. We can remain separate. We can remain the children of God. We can be everything that Christ wants us to be. We can properly show love towards him and love to our neighbor, and all the while be subject unto higher powers that are trying to make us not do all those things. How? Appeal up to what Christ did and walk in what he did. 
Heal the sick, feed the hungry, preach righteousness, assemble with believers, rebuke, reprove, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Say truth, do truth, be truth. That's our charge in this world. And that's how we fulfill Romans 13 perfectly. We simply be Christians. Walk godly in this present evil world. Put on the armor of light. Walk honestly and walk in Christ. Any flesh, don't make provision for it. Why? Because that's the old man. Because that's the old world. Because that's the old flesh. We're different than that. We're separate. We are now children of light. Walk as children of light. Not in the flesh. Not in the lust thereof. But as Christ walked and so fulfill the law. And so fulfill your duty as a civilized Christian. We are simply the children of God who are strangers and pilgrims in this country that we currently live in. We do resemble them and have a few things in common, but we ought to walk separately and show that we are ambassadors representing and as the mouthpiece for Christ, we ought to submit ourselves unto the higher powers as is proper and as is ordered in the scriptures and we're to be loving examples of the Lord God that bought us in the beginning and caused us to be all of these things. Don't use the liberty in Christ as an occasion to the flesh, but rather use it to be a testimony to this lost, dying, dark, and wicked nation that we live in. It's the best thing we can do. Just be a Christian. Enough said. I'm so thankful, God, for this word. Help us to understand this more.